Welcome all of you to the 47th live webinar on orthopedic principles. This time we have Dr. Anjani Kumar Singh from Liverpool, United Kingdom with us. He's going to enlighten us about ankle arthritis with respect to the fellowship examination. Dr. Anjani Singh is attached to the Royal University Hospital, Liverpool, NHS. His area of interest is foot and ankle surgery and he has done a lot of work on foot and ankle surgery his multiple international publications to his credit. And he's done a couple of fellowships as well on foot and ankle surgery. Over to you, Dr. Anjani. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gopalan. Uh, hi there, good afternoon. Um, uh, I'm Anjani Singh, um, and I'm gonna to talk to you about ankle arthritis, which is gonna be fo focused on the fellowship uh, examination. So we'll start with um, with history taking, the question which you should be asking for a short or intermediate case with a short examination technique. And then we'll talk about management principles relating to non-operative and operative planning. Um, so ankle arthritis, um, it is uh, more commonly injured than any other joint in the body. Um, and it's subject to a lot of weight bearing force per centimeter square than any other joint. Uh, although the prevalence of ankle arthritis is at least nine times lower than the hip or the knee. Um, and most of the cause of ankle arthritis is related to trauma, which could be from soft tissue injury like ankle sprains, uh, fractures, uh, as well as peel on fractures. So just a brief uh, introduction about anatomy. You would be aware it's a hinge joint that includes the tibia, talus, and the fibula. Uh, and the talar dome uh, on its anatomical aspect is more biconcave -con with a central area. Uh, and the range of movement uh, is varies from 20 degrees dorsiflexion to around 50 degrees of plantar flexion. Uh, as mentioned before, um, most part of the ankle arthritis is related to trauma, which forms more than two thirds of the ankle etiology for ankle arthritis. And this is related more to the incongruence, which happens during this course in the ankle joint, which leads to more than 40% increase in the contact stress uh, across the joint. Uh, primary osteoarthritis accounts for less than 10% of uh, ankle arthritis, and this is possibly because of the high congruency of the ankle joint with stability, which is offered by the dynamic and the static stabilizers, uh, as well as the property of the ankle cartilage, which is supposed to have a higher tensile strength uh, than other joints in the body, like the hip and the knee. Other etiologies would be rheumatoid arthritis, uh, osteonecrosis, um, possibly of the talus related to steroid consumption or chronic alcoholism, uh, neuropathic joints, uh, charco or uh, tapes dorsalis are more commonly, uh, I mean, it's not as common as before as leprosy, um, risk of septic arthritis uh, leading to infection and collapse of the bone, gout, um, seronegative crystallopathies, as well as hemophiliacs. Um, so any non-anatomic fracture healings alter the joint contact forces of the ankle and changes the load bearing mechanism of the ankle joint, which leads to degeneration of the cartilage surface culminating into uh, uh, osteoarthritis. Uh, just briefly touching on classification. Um, this is the classification which is popularized by Takakura, uh, which again goes with any uh, radiographic classification from one to four early stages of a sclerosis osteophyte formation with preserved joint space and then subsequent narrowing of the joint space culminating into obliteration of the joint space with complete bone contact, which is stage four. So uh, when a patient presents with history of pain in the ankle difficulty mobilizing, um, what are the Im important relevant points which you need to um, isolate from the history? Uh, most foremost is history of trauma or recurrent, recurrent ankle sprains or instability of the ankle. Uh, also history of inflammatory arthritis, if they've got other joints in the body which are affected, or they've got history of rheumatoid arthritis or seronegative arthritis. Uh, that is important. 
as well as if you could have got a history of um, inherited blood disorders like hemophilia, um, gout, um, risk of avascular necrosis, secondary to steroid consumption or alcohol intake, as well as infection, um, which can cause that. Also history of diabetes and polyneuropathy leading to Charcot joint with um, um, collapse and disorganization of the joint is an important um, factor which needs to be isolated in the history taking. Uh, going on the pattern of pain, most of these patients present with history of pain and you can actually decipher from the type of pain they are experiencing to isolate any localized pathology. Like if they get a lot of um, walking uphill pain, then they have anterior ankle impingement. Um, uh, downhill pain is more when the posterior part of the talus is in the platform, which we call posterior ankle arthritis. Uh, uneven grounds, that's quite a common thing. We see people who have quite a lot of subtalar pathology. Uh, they, have, they do not tolerate very well on uneven ground surfaces and companies of increasing pain. Uh, also, there is risk of um, subfibular pain, which could be related to a valgus hind foot, uh, also due to um, calcaneal impingement. Uh, as well as uh, disorder of the tendons uh, like the peroneae. So in terms of presentation, they normally present with symptoms of pain on weight bearing in the early stage. Subsequently, if the ankle arthritis progresses, they get pain at night, um, difficulty to manage or walk for long distances, um, being woken up with pain at night, uh, history of swelling, uh, loss of motion. Also, there could be history of clicking or crepitus from the joint with history of instability or the ankle giving way uh, due to loose bodies, etc. Uh, physical examination, normally you would isolate and swelling around the ankle joint. You could have history of previous surgery, so there could be scars around, which you ne need to look for and mention in your examination finding, which could be um, scars in the front of the ankle from um, fixation or from the side, or uh, which would indicate that they've had bimalar or trimalar ankle fractures. Um, pain on range of movement, uh, both passively and actively. Uh, also, the range of movement in that ankle would be reduced to the normal ankle, uh, and that should be examined as well, or at least mention that you would compare the movements with the other normal side. Uh, in order to uh, move on with the examination and rather than uh, waste time on uh, this. Angular deformities also need to be looked at. They could be presenting with a valgus or varus heel. Um, so that needs to be mentioned as well when you are uh, examining them in the exam. Um, again, the most important aspect is you would be asked to examine would be to get the patient up and let get them to walk. <laughs> Um, and that is when you would find out whether they have an antalgic gait pattern, they are rushing through the stance phase of the gait, uh, they walk with an extended knee in order to compensate for the equinus deformity of the ankle, um, as well as swelling, joint effusion and pain, as we discussed before. Equinus contraction need to be isolated, ligament instability, you need to test for your anterior drawer, and also this would be quite relevant from the history if they have uh, symptoms of instability, and also tendon examination and testing for the strength of the tendon. So what are you going to look for when they are going to walk? Uh, you need to see what is the, how they walk in the stance phase. Are they rushing through? Are they in pain? Is there an antalgic gait pattern? And also look at the three rockers of the gait, which the heel strike, the uh, flat foot or the forefoot loading, as well as propulsion, which is the third phase of the stance gait. Uh, and this would isolate where exactly is the problem in terms of if they have a uh, equinus contracture, the contract phase would be um, abnormal. And if they have got an anterior tibial osteophyte or anterior impingement, then the propulsion would be abnormal. So this would help you isolate uh, the problem associated with that. And also if the gait is symmetrical, so both this is happening on both sides or just one side and you need to look at that and further decipher it and the important bit is you need to mention uh, 
the heel strike, the mid stance, and the propulsion, and that would give you an idea of the pathology uh, whereabouts it would be. But most of the time, these patients are in a lot of pain, and uh, they would be difficult to actually get them to walk in an examination setting. So if the patient says that they can't walk or the examination tells you not to, then you should just briefly touch on those points that I would examine them standing up, walking, and also assess the gait pattern to look at what exactly is the restriction in terms of the stance phase. And that should give you points uh, for the examination uh, techniques. Again, you need to get them to stand up or just if they are sitting on the end of the couch, you can mention if you find anything abnormal, any scars on the, on the foot needs to be looked at. Then also dynamic loading of the foot with isolate a uh, longitudinal arch problem, is there a pest penis or a clavus deformity, is there hyperpronation, uh, hallux valgus, hyperpronated foot plus also toe deformity. Um, also look at the heel alignment from the back. So uh, means I normally get them to stand in my clinic and I go around the patient in 360 degrees to check from the front, from the side and the back. And that helps me isolate uh, that without moving the patient too much around. Um, so heel alignment, Achilles tendon, too many toes. Uh, like this uh, picture, you can see that there is hind foot valgus there. Uh, and you can see a lot of um, two, uh, toes, which is more than two and a half, which you should normally see. And this would uh, suggest that this person has got uh, a plantar valgus feet with her hind foot valgus now. It is to be established whether this is a fixed deformity or uh, it's a mobile deformity. So then move on to the next phase, which is the feel part. Now this again, uh, you have to be fairly sure that uh, you don't cause much pain to the patient. So always a good starting point to ask which is the area which is more sore or causing them pain and move from, uh, from the less painful area or the normal area into the area which is being pointed out as causing the pain. And then that would reduce the risk of causing a lot of pain because what you don't want is to cause significant amount of discomfort to the patient. And it also sort of um, marks you down on by the examiner having caused pain to the patient. So I would not do that very profoundly, but make sure you establish with the patient, which is the painful area and keep away from that. And then again, go on the principles of bone, ligament, joint, tenderness, palpation, look for swelling and look for sensations. And by all means, finish your, your examination with palping, uh, palpating the pulses because that would complete your examination and it would also ensure that you have made an attempt to check that. And if you are not able to just mention that you would finish off the examination by checking the neurovascular status of the foot. Next, moving on to the move uh, phase, which is you examine for range of motion, you look for a special test, which could be involving your anterior draw test, also checking for the Coleman Bock test if you're worried about um, high arch feet, also gastrocnemius tightness, assess for deformity, is this a fixed or a mobile deformity, does it correct, is the, is the hind foot supinating on the patient going up on a single leg stance phase, uh, also, the relation of the hind foot to the forefoot. So if you correct the, the forefoot or if you correct the hind foot into neutral, what happens to the forefoot? So these are important aspects to look for and comment for. Uh, but it also depends upon whether this is a short case, which gives you only five minutes, or whether it's an intermediate case, which is 15 minutes. In that case, you have five minutes for examination. You have more time to comment on all these things. Um, so again, um, this is what the silver skulls test is. It tests for um, gastrocnemius tightness and isolate between gastrocnemius or Achilles tightness and tells you about what, what you need to do to isolate the problem. So I'm gonna run this video and you can have a look uh, with this. We're going to demonstrate the silver skull test in this part of the examination. The silver skull test is the way of assessing contracture of the heel cord. The heel cord is a a term that we use loosely to describe the gastrocnemius and soleus as they connect through the Achilles tendon to the heel. The Achilles tendon, either both muscles or only the gastrocnemius, may be contracted along with foot deformities. And it's often the contracture of the heel cord, one or both portions, that contribute to pain 
in foot deformities, whereas the foot deformities on their own may not cause that much pain or disability. We need to assess which is tight, and if surgery is required, lengthen only the one muscle or two that's contracted. To do this exam, we need to recognize that the gastrocnemius starts above the knee and the soleus starts below the knee. Though they combine and they end together in a single Achilles tendon, the position of the knee when we're performing this test is critical. We also need to appreciate that the ankle joint dorsiflexes and plantar flexes and the subtalar joint dorsiflexes and plantar flexes. It dorsiflexes as a component of valgus eversion and it plantar flexes as a component of varus inversion. When we're performing the silverscale test, we're trying to isolate the one joint, the ankle joint, to determine whether it can dorsiflex and plantar flex. To do that, we need to eliminate any dorsiflexion or plantar flexion to the, to the subtalar joint. To do that, with my left hand, I am inverting and everting the subtalar joint. That's inversion varus. That's eversion valgus. I need, with my thumb on the tail and the joint, to neutralize or so-called lock the subtalar joint. In a flat foot, that would be by inverting until I feel that the tail and the joint is aligned. And in a varus foot, it would be by everting until my thumb demonstrates that the tail and the joint is aligned or so-called locked. Now, maintaining subtalar neutral and locked any up or down ankle, any up or down motion is occurring at the ankle joint, and that's what we need to know. So, with this hand, I neutral subtalar joint, maintaining alignment at the tail and navicular joint as a proxy for the subtalar joint, and then I flex the knee to relax the gastrocnemius. Now, the dorsiflexion that we see is demonstrates the flexibility of the soleus. The gastrocnemius has been relaxed above the knee. Subtalar joint has been neutralized, and this 15 degrees of dorsiflexion between the lateral border of the foot, not the medial, but the lateral border of the foot and the tibia, demonstrates that the soleus is not contracted. It would not ever need to be lengthened, even if we were performing a foot reconstruction. Now, maintaining that subtalar neutral with the thumb on the tail and the joint, we try to maintain dorsiflexion at the ankle while extending the knee and tightening the gastroc at this end. Now, the gastrocnemius allows only about five or six degrees of dorsiflexion, subtalar neutral, knee extended. And the difference between six degrees of pure ankle dorsiflexion and 15 degrees is the contracture of the gastrocnemius. If, Xander, we're having foot reconstruction for one reason or another, we would say that he would perhaps need lengthening of the gastrocnemius alone by a stray or vulpius procedure, but we would not want to lengthen his Achilles tendon because the soleus is not contracted. On the other hand, if he lacked dorsiflexion with knee extended and he still lacked dorsiflexion with the knee flex, that would be an indication to lengthen the entire Achilles tendon because both the soleus and the gastrocnemius are contracted. So then we move on to the range of movement uh, examination of isolating the ankle joint and the subtalar joint. And what I find very useful is to, as demonstrated in these pictures here, that hold the talus neck and you have, would have an estimate of where the talus is and without, and in that case, you're neutralizing the talus in the, in the ankle mortis. And then you have an idea of how much dorsiflexion, plant flexion they have without actually causing um, this or uh, erroneously confusing it with the subtalar movement. So this is what I do routinely in my practice is to uh, have a feel of the tailor neck. And once you have control of the talus, then you can do your dorsiflexion and plantar flexion. And also at the other side, you're cupping the heel. So the subtalar is uh, neutralized. And again, it will show you the dorsiflexion of around 15 degrees, the plantar flexion of around 45 degrees. So investigations, as with any ankle pathology, if they come to it, you need to do the basic investigation. Uh, obviously, if you're worried about infection, if you've got any concerns about whether they have inflammatory arthropathy, then you need to check for the inflammatory rheumatoid profile. You need to do full blood count, ESR, also CRP for any uh, infection. 
Uh, radiograph is the primary line of investigation where we get weight bearing AP lateral uh, views um, and the findings as with any radiographic findings you know is joint space narrowing, subchondral sclerosis and cyst formation uh, and also collapse of the joint space and hibernation of the bone with any deformity in the plane which would be easily isolated on the weight bearing views. Now if there is a concern about a further fracture higher up like a tibial shaft fracture or maybe a femur fracture, then in that case, I would um, at least mention for the examination finding that you would like to uh, have um, a full length view of the leg to ensure the uh, mechanical alignment uh, in terms of any reconstructive surgery. And at the same time, you should be also mentioning that you would examine the joint, which is the knee joint and the hip joint of the patient because obviously, they are all, the ankle is connected to the hip, and if there's a problem primarily higher up, then we would need to really look at addressing the problem higher up before we actually go down onto the ankle. So these are things which you could actually mention um, to the examiner to say, I'll finish my examination by examining the hip and the knee, and that would give you uh, or hold you in good stead with the examiner. And again, special investigations like CT, MRI scan, if you're concerned about you want to isolate the joint or if there's deformity, you need to have more 3D reconstruction than CT or MRI would isolate more problems with avascular necrosis, uh, any collapse. Um, and then diagnostic joint injection, that is another tool to isolate the pathology if it's ankle, is it subtalar or is it further in the midfoot which is causing the problem. So now moving on to management, um, it is a dictum that whenever an examiner asks you in the exam, what are the management principles, you should always start with a non-operative treatment. If you jump onto surgery, then it would not be a good thing and you would lose marks on it. So I would say always start with non-operative treatment, talk about activity modification, weight reduction, if the patient has a big body habitus, uh, bracing or immobilizing of the ankle, as well as non-steroid anti-inflammatories. Anti, uh, anti you need to talk about rocosol, uh, which is what is here, which reduces the stress on the ankle joint, all the UCBL Arizona brace. Also talk about intra-articular steroid injections to reduce the pain and also to use this as a diagnostic tool. And visco supplementation, although the evidence for this is not strong enough, uh, but some of the um, centers do offer them to patients. Um, and then moving on to operative treatment, then if they have failed the conservative line, uh, then in that case, you should talk about operative um, management strategy uh, and with the proven evidence of degenerate joint and after maybe steroid injection, you've established that the patient has got problems from the ankle joint and no other joint is involved, then you can base your strategy on that. So always pre-operative planning, you have to rule out subtalar degenerative joint disease. Uh, you might have to get a CT scan to isolate that. And if you're still in a chondry, maybe a diagnostic selective injection would help in isolating the joint. Sometimes you need a combined fusion of both the subtalar and the ankle joint in case of gauze deformity and osteoarthritis affecting both the joints. Sometimes it could be even a pantalar arthritis, a pantalar fusion, uh, if they have got involvement of the um, ankle, subtalar, and all the triple joints. And if you are concerned about AVN, if there's collapse, or you see that there's evidence of a cystic formation in the talus, then I would say that we would get an MRI scan to stage it further for the reconstruction options because these have to be um, part of the pre-op plan. So if you need any allograft, if you need extra bone, or if you need some special instrumentation, then you've got that on the shelf before you go ahead and try to do that. So, and then again, pre-operative planning will be based on your clinical examination as Previously in the video, you'd isolate whether it's a cleese tightness or whether they need a gastric recession or a medial head of gastric release. Also, if they have got anterior osteophyte, if they have got symptoms of anterior impingement, accident of osteophyte is what will be, which you could do arthroscopically. 
and also difference deformity of virus, valgus, how are you going to correct it? Is that going to be all corrected within the joint or would you have to do a supplemental osteotomy like um, the supramadial osteotomy or do you need to do a calcaneal osteotomy to balance the hind foot? So these things have to be all thought about in the preoperative planning. So goal. So when you talk to the examiner about what you're trying to achieve here for any foot condition, these are the buzzwords. You have to tell them, I wish to create a painless, stable, and a plantigrade foot. And if you tell them that, that would actually cover everything about the surgical management or a respective non-operative management strategy for the foot. So this is something which you need to tell them. And then the options here are joint preserving and joint sacrificing. So joint preserving is if the whole part of the joint is not affected, if they've got pain related to anterior osteophyte, then, or if they've got some osteochondral lesion, then you can offer them arthroscopic ankle debridement, microfracture. Also, if there is a part partial avian of your talus, then you could do an allograft transplantation, although this has got a high risk of failure with over 30%. Joint distraction arthro arthroplasty has been talked about. That's another option. And then supramalar osteotomy, that is the ankle joint is very localized affection with good range of movement. Uh, and in a young patient, that could be considered as well. But in terms of if there's a complete collapse of the joint with advanced end-stage arthritis, then options are fairly limited. It can be either an ankle arthrodesis, which could be by means of open, mini open or arthroscopic, or a total ankle replacement. So these are the joint sacrificing one, depending upon the degree of arthritis and the pattern of it, whether it's local or is it, whether it's global all around. Um, so, again, ankle debridement with anterior tibial osteophyte removal. So, as in this x ray, you can see that that huge anterior tibial osteophyte. And the patient is typically getting pain when they're walking up the stairs or going uphill. That's what this bit of uh, bone is going on there and causing impingement on the tail and neck. In that case, taking this off with arthroscopy, if you can. Uh, is going to give good symptomatic relief to the patient. But that is only in the case if that is the isolated pathology. If the whole joint is collapsed, then there wouldn't be much of a benefit with taking that osteophyte off. As we uh, talked about distraction arthroplasty, that is something which is still practiced in some centers, but there's not a huge amount of evidence about that. Ideal candidate is younger than 45 years old with post-traumatic osteoarthritis. Ankle range of movement is reasonably well preserved. Arthritis is not severe and the joint is congruent. So these things have to be taken uh, in consideration. And then of course, you need to have the expertise, the surgical expertise to do that because it would require a frame which needs to be put on. You need to be having a patient who's going to be compliant to tolerate this. And again, the results of that are fairly guarded in the literature. Supramalar osteotomy has been popularized, and that is for patients who are young, who has got near normal range of movement, but only very minor, minor involvement of the joint with minimum valgus and varus tilt with uh, localized cartilage loss, which you would obviously isolate by an MRI scan or maybe a diagnostic arthroscope, arthroscopy examination to check how much of the loss is it. And then these patients could be looked into by managing that. But I mean, this. Uh, surgical series from Takakura, which was of 18 patients, mentioned that there was some good functional benefit after surgery on these patients, with three of them managing with fair degree, rest all having good results. Uh, but again, that also depends upon the, local, uh, upon the localization of the arthritis. So in my practice, I don't see many of these patients which are actually um, amenable to having a supramedial osteotomy. They fairly come in an advanced stage of arthritis. So next, moving on to arthrodesis. So this is mainly for post-traumatic or inflammatory arthritis. There's malari malar if there's malalignment of the joint, then you need to consider and combine it with osteotomies. It provides a really a reliable relief of pain and return to activity of daily living. And it is still considered by quite a lot of foot and ankle surgeons as a gold standard for management of advanced ankle arthritis. Although with changing trends and with newer 
um, technology and implants coming in. This could change over a period of time, but still remains one of the um, um, major uh, operations for advanced ankle arthritis. The complication with this is that because of your fusing that joint, it is loading the joint below, so they'll develop subtellar arthritis, and this paper shows that 50% of them do have some demonstrable changes in 10 years following an ankle arthrodesis. And risk factor always of non-union. People who smoke, there's a high risk of non-union of the ankle, so you need to always have a good discussion with them prior to surgery. And revision and union rates are around 80%. So initially, it, it works to around 90% success uh, after arthroscopic ankle fusion. So again, ankle fusion can be done open, mini open and arthroscopic assisted. Uh, and this study quoted here from Townsend et al. Uh, looked at uh, 102 ankles and they, they came to a conclusion that arthroscopic ankle fusions give them a good functional relief from pain. Also, it lessens the length of stay in the hospital, but as such, the complication and the radiographic time and the surgical time remain the same for both of the procedures. So again, if you have the expertise, then ankle arthrosis as an arthroscopy is a good technique. Uh, and I do that regularly in my practice. I've stopped doing open uh, because I feel that you are preserving the, the milieu or the internal environment with periosteal blood supply, everything else, and you're just debriding the joint and doing it with by small stab incisions with another incision to stabilize with two screws. So I find it quite helpful and have had good success with ankle arthroscopic ankle fusion. So again, problem with arthrodesis is it could be around 30 to 40% non-union rate, depending upon what technique you use. Uh, it, it does give initial pain relief, but then you could have such adjacent joint degenerative changes, which could cause further problems. There's functional limitations. So you are walking with a short stance, um, uneven surface is not very well tolerated. And sometimes you still have to have shoe modification like a rocker sole uh, to, uh, to wear even after these surgeries. And as I mentioned before, there's risk of uh, advanced arthritis progressing into the subtellar joint at around 10 years time. So regarding the concepts, you need to know about technical consideration. You could do an in-situ fusion depending upon if there's no deformity. If there is some deformity, then you could actually correct it uh, within the fusion uh, rather than doing an adjacent osteotomy. So these considerations have to be taken in. Um, again, you need to make sure that you're preserving the periosteum and doing very minimal periosteal stripping. You have good rigid fixation um, techniques, which could be with screws or with now new anatomically contoured plates. Um, also external fixation, if you've got the surgical expertise to do that, that is also a fallback for, the, uh, for managing these. And always look at how you're going to fuse that. So that's a relevant uh, examination question about how you're going to, uh, in what position would you fuse the ankle? And then you need to make sure you need to tell that it's, it should be a plantigrade foot where the foot comes in neutral onto the floor. It should be five to seven degrees of hind foot valgus uh, with neutral or around five degrees of dorsiflexion with no equinus. And rotation needs to be equal to the other side with around 10, 15 degrees. So avoid with open ankle, you need to make sure you're aware of the skin uh, and also make full thickness flaps and be aware of the anatomy in terms of the neurovascular state bundles as well as the superficial peroneal nerve and the sural nerve if you're doing a lateral approach. And you need to create good um, cancellous bone surface, uh, which has got bleeding surface area, remove all the cartilage and also use and drill to try to um, in integrate more surface area across that. Always use bone graft or sometimes you might use artificial. I tend to use a lot of eyelid crest. If there's a defect, I fill that with cancellous bone from the eyelid crest. And you need to stabilize with rigid fixation. So you need to have that in hand and appropriate alignment to create a panty foot. So these are the principles. 
Complications, again, soft tissue infection is quite common. You need to be very aware about your tissue handling, taking off all the devitalized tissue. Um, be aware of your neurovascular bundles and the nerves. And also always be taking more time to prepare the joint uh, and making sure that there's good contact between the bone surfaces and adequately rigidly immobilized with a uh, strong sound fixation technique. And you should reduce the risk of any malalignment because if you do feel that there is, you can't get the ankle into a plantigrade position, is there something else needs to do? Do you need to do a soft tissue release? Is the tendon Achilles tight? You need to release that. Um, so these needs to be really looked at intraoperatively while you're doing this. Uh, so advantages of the open is you have good visualization, uh, you're able to, to address complex deformities, uh, and you can look at better opposition of the joint surface. Uh, disadvantages, again, is you would compromise um, dissection with blood supply, might have to do more periosteal stripping. And it's a much more bloodier operation uh, than if you're doing it arthroscopically. So with arthroscopic fusion, the advantages are basically minimal dissection. You get two stab holes for your portals and decreased wound complication. Uh, and you have minimal interference with any other surrounding tissues. It is slightly more technically challenging. Um, and of course, you need to have uh, good skills of, with arthroscopy initially to do these. Although once you go into the joint, you really not, don't need to be so much constrained about the articular surface because you would be going to taking that off. So don't be um, sort of concerned if you have scuffed the cartilage or anything, because that's all going to go with the curette or with the bar. Um, and sometimes you do have fusion surface, especially the back of the ankle. You can't really get your scope or a shaver unless you do a posterior portal. So that those things are there, which are the downside. Plus you can't create, a, can't correct a significant amount of deformity. I mean, you could correct 10 to 15 degrees of valgus uh, in there uh, by taking off one area more than the other uh, and also reusing your screws sequentially, uh, but not anything beyond that. Uh, so this is a case uh, uh, of a patient uh, with advanced ankle arthritis. Uh, you see that there's collapse and you can look at the soft tissue envelope and say that this patient was quite obese um, and she had recurrent instability of the ankle which led to arthritis. Um, so this one was treated with arthroscopic ankle fusion uh, and she has done well after that. She is mobilizing, she's not in any pain and I didn't have to uh, make a huge cut with it because she was uh, an appropriate one for an arthroscopic fusion. So open one, again, the open techniques can be approached, can be through the lateral, where you take the fibula off and go through the lateral side, but that's the downside is that there can never be a total ankle replacement candidate because of taking the fibula. You could destabilize the ankle, and there is some studies to show that they've got a higher risk of non-union. Uh, posterior, you could go that if the anterior skin is very poor. I haven't had any uh, experience in doing a posterior ankle fusion, but there are some special plates which you could do uh, operation from the posterior point where you go through a tender Achilles splitting approach. And then anterior is going through um, the tibialis anterior and the FA, um, FHL interval in the front. So just the other, uh, the other obvious new trend is total ankle replacement, uh, which is again for end stage arthritis and it is a joint sacrificing operation. It has got some good proponents to it, which is it's a safe and effective alternative then to an ankle arthrosis, which was a, which is a gold standard. Um, but you need to have very strict patient selection criteria. Um, the patient should be of low demand, um, possible post-traumatic or rheumatoid arthritis. Um, want to most of the time the patients come to me and say that they don't want to lose their ankle movement. In that case. Uh, this is the only operation would retain some mobility of the ankle joint. You would get less chance of adjacent joint loading and less risk of uh, adjacent joint arthrosis than as in ankle arthrosis. And this has got the gait speed and the stride length are not compromised as you would see with an ankle arthrosis. 
The contraindications, uh, which are absolute and relative, is active infection. You don't want to put up a prosthetic joint in an infection or a skin uh, problem with ulcerations. Patients who are who got shock with neuroarthropathy, which lack the proprioceptive feedback from the ankle joint, will not have the ability, and there would be a certain failure of the arthroplasty in that. People who have got peripheral vascular disease, they are not going to heal well and cause problems with wound complications. If deformity is quite significant, you would like to stay away from doing a, a big correction and doing a total ankle because it could further lead to more risk of revision. Smoking is another relatively risk, relative risk factor. If the patient has severe osteoporosis, you should be aware you could potentially cause fracture, especially of the talus, talar osteonecrosis. Ankle instability. If the patient morbidly obese, you don't want to do that because of the risk of revision and failure. And young laborers who are going to return back to active um, work pattern and laboring jobs, which would cause more stress to the prosthetic joint. So these are some of the contraindications. Some are some are relative in this. So now, as we said, with the changing trends of ankle arthroplasty, we've got some new implants on the shelf. On your left is the, is the star ankle, which is uh, the only FDA approved ankle uh, in the States. Uh, and I tend to use them in my practice here. Um, and you've, this is a mobile bearing with a, a mobile bearing with the three component. Whereas on the right is the new, um, right medical infinity ankle, which has got, um, which is a fixed bearing two component. Um, and these newer implants are um, letting us minimize bony resection and we are retaining more soft tissue envelope around there, plus with modified jigging, uh, jig techniques and cuts are much more uh, well refined. And it, um, it has got a, quite a lot of learning curve to it, uh, but um, it is, it works well in patients who have gone through a proper counseling and you have actually identified that they would do better with um, an ankle arthroplasty. So again, it's all down to patient selection. Again, preoperative planning for this is quite important. As I was telling you before, for when it comes to clinical examination, you need to make sure that the, the leg is mechanically well aligned. If they've got any uh, fractures like this uh, X-ray, you see there's a mid shaft tibia fracture and also a femur fracture. And this gentleman has got quite advanced ankle arthritis. Um, so your investigation strategy would be to get long leg views, to have an idea of how you're going to cut the, um, and the, tibia, um, the tibia and the ankle mortis, what, ang uh, what angulation and everything else. So this needs to be really thought through quite well before you proceed with anything. And this gentleman was very keen to have an ankle replacement. Um, and um, he did happen to have one. Uh, and it's still faring well. Uh, it's over five years and he's still managing uh, quite well. And I've seen him recently, he's got no pain. Uh, he's got more pain from his hip now, uh, but he's keeping away from having any surgery. So again, current evidence about ankle arthroplasty. These are some um, evidence space which you could look up and they tell us a lot in details. And there's a lot of new evidence coming through as the time is going past, um, which tells us that in good, in patients which are thoroughly gone through a counseling process and uh, strict patient criteria, uh, these do work well uh, with at the moment 10 year survival rate of around 89% with improvement or in the AOFAS score from 40 to 80. And the average range of movement also better than if they have fusion of that and functional outcome is better, although in comparison to an ankle arthrodesis, there's still more complications with revision with total ankle replacements. So again, this is not meant for everybody and should not be offered to everyone. So now, the, the always a debate in any foot and ankle congress you go to, there's always a thing about ankle fusion or total ankle replacement. Um, and we, in, in the United Kingdom, we have got the TARWA trial, which is uh, total ankle versus uh, arthroplasty, which is still the figures are coming through. Um, so this is going to be basically 
a discussion with the patient which you need to have. Uh, what are they looking for? Is the patient suitable to have that? Are there, what are their expectations? Are there realistic expectations? Are they smoker? What is their job occupation? Are they low demand? So these are things which you need to do. So fusion is more reliable. It's safer because you don't have to have another procedure and it offers good pain relief. But on that side, you lose the motion in the ankle joint. It causes adjacent joint arthritis from which the patient would get symptoms and maybe might return to have further surgery done. And not all patients are happy with the fusion. And you have to be aware that um, you will be having problems with wearing high heel shoes and everything else. So you need to be very sure about um, fusion. Whereas in replacements, uh, you get more movement or preserved movement but potentially better function and the recovery is better because you're going to get them moving fairly quickly. Whereas in the, in the fusion category, you will have to get them into a plaster, non-weight bearing for some period of time. Um, and it can be, it, I mean, it's, as I said, it's a long learning curve for these, steep learning curve for surgeons and people who have been shown to be doing quite a lot of them in a year have got less risk of complication and there is evidence to support this. Uh, and at one point was said that you need to do at least a good number of 50 ankle arthroplasties before your risk of reducing complications um, is better. It's more risky to the patient because you never know, they might come in for a revision, they might develop wound infection, they might develop aseptic loosening. So these risks are there. So if the patient wants one procedure and doesn't want to think about it, then maybe this is not for them. And it's always harder to revise later. So if they have a problem uh, and there's a collapse or something like that, then you have to revise. Now the options are whether you revise it into another total ankle, which is technically more difficult with more area of bone loss, or you just fuse them with an allograft. So that's another issue which you need to discuss with the patient. So as I said, decision-making is very important for total ankle or ankle arthrosis. It's individual patients. It does not suit everybody. You need to take into account patient comorbidities, are they diabetic, do they smoke, have they got good vascular status, what is their level of function, uh, if they are active manual laboral, they will not do well with a total ankle, would wear them out very quickly, and what is the desired outcome, is the ankle fairly stiff, because again, the ankle motions are very much dependent as proven in the knee, that if they have got quite a stiff knee, the movements after an arthroplasty does not improve markedly, so it all sort of is relevant to ankle surgery as well. Then the other point of view is the surgeon experience. How experienced is the surgeon? What is, how much ankle arthroplasties have been done by them? Soft tissue adequacy of the, uh, of the envelope around the ankle joint, perfusion adequacy. Is there any neuropathy able to, to correct the deformity? And then you always need to think about whether you need to combine with other procedures, which would be by means of aligning the hind foot, doing a calcium knee osteotomy, the valgizing or valgizing it, subtalar fusion at the same time. If, you're, if you've got some evidence of AVN of the talus, then you do a subtalar fusion and an ankle arthroplasty on top of it. And then also you might have to stabilize the lateral ligaments uh, at the same time, or maybe do the ankle uh, ligaments first and then do an arthroplasty. So these have all to be taken into consideration. So that finishes the talk. Um, I have covered presentation. We've talked about examination techniques, what you need to be telling the examiner, what are the buzzwords you need to be telling about management strategy, non-operative and then operative in any case, surgical decision-making, you need to tell them how you're going to decide about ankle replacements or, or, or ankle arthrodesis, patient selection criteria, and also pre-op planning. So supplemental procedures, whether you need to combine them with osteotomies, ligament reconstruction, uh, etc. Uh, so the, this uh, concludes my talk um, and I'm happy to take any questions if um, required. Thank you, Dr. Singh, for that excellent presentation. If, uh, it has been a very enlightening talk. Uh, there are a couple of questions that have come up. Okay. Yeah, one is uh, regarding the choice of treatment. For example, you have a low demand patient with end stage arthritis 
And what do you, for the exam point of view, what, what would you really suggest? Is it a total ankle replacement or ankle fusion, arthroscopy or open for the fellowship exam? Means as I said, uh, the treatment still remains gold standard is a fusion, but you need to customize it for each patient and see if it's a low demand patient and they are not very active. Then, if they have got all the criteria, where they're, they're non-smoker, they've got good blood supply, and there's no signs of any infection around there, then you can talk to them about an ankle replacement. So I would approach, if the examiner asks you, what are the options here? You would say the options are end-state arthritis. It is a joint sacrificing operation, an ankle arthrodesis or a total ankle replacement. And ankle arthrodesis is a gold standard treatment. And I think the patient would do well with it, but I would talk to the patient to ensure that they are happy to lose the movement in the ankle and they are aware of the potential complications of arthritis of arthrodesis, which is adjacent joint changes and some inability to um, progress with the stance phase and the gait pattern. So for the exam point of view, I would say arthrodesis, but if the patient is keen to retain some movement, then there are some new evidence or there's some new prosthesis in the market, which I would talk to them or counsel them about a total ankle replacement but they should be aware that there's a risk of failure and they might require further surgery. And uh, suppose your choice is ankle fusion. Uh, can, do we have enough evidence to say that arthroscopic ankle fusion fares better than an open ankle fusion? Well, we have evidence in terms of uh, wound complications. We have evidence in terms of length of stay in hospital uh, and also post-operative pain relief. So in the, I mean, the studies which I quoted have looked at both open and arthroscopic ones and the arthroscopic ones perform better with function as well as with length of stay, but complications were more or less the same on both but sides. So fusion rates. Yeah, fusion rates are more or less the same. Okay, so I think uh, that's a valid answer for the exam that you say arthroscopic ankle fusion as a gold standard, right? Well, if you've got the expertise, you say, I mean, first thing is you'll say fusion of the ankle and then depending upon the expertise of, or if you've got the skill mix an arthroscopic and arthroscopic is better because if, if you can do that and you're good in arthroscopy and because you don't have a wound problem with it, um, there's no periosteal dissection and there's minimal joint space uh, preparation as well. So, I mean, the, the drawback is you can't correct a huge amount of deformity with it, uh, but it preserves the soft tissue around there. And in particular patients like diabetics and all where you don't want to go around making a huge cut and everything else because of risk of infection, they work pretty well. So I would say ankle arthrodesis, possible arthroscopic if we have, um, if we have the, um, the skill mix. And uh, you always use the screws from medial to lateral, like proximal medial to la uh, distal lateral. Is that the way you configure your screws? Yeah, yeah. I, okay. I mean, I have, I mean, that, that X-ray which I showed was of an arthroscopic fusion. And I find it useful just to, once we take the scope off and everything, the distraction, then just approach medially. But I have done a couple of open a couple of years ago where I had put some screws from the lateral side as well. Okay, so I, I use two screws, yeah. Okay, and do you believe in the lax screw principle while you do the screws? Well, these are um, sure. these are cannulated screws, basically. So I mean, there's no. I mean, I put a washer on there. So, yeah, in in a way. So if you so if if I've got a mild degree of virus, then what I do is I put the two wires in, but I put the the lateral screw first, so that sort of pulls the talus out a bit into valgus uh, and that, that offers compression. So, I mean, obviously these are cannulated partially threaded screws, so they are offering compression, but I'm not over drilling or under drilling like in normal screw pattern, if you're trying to do the lag technique. And uh, suppose in the, if you're doing an open fusion, what is the technique that you follow generally when, when you are doing those procedures before? Well, open, I mean, I have done uh, open before. Um, I normally tend to do it 
with an anterior approach, like you do a total ankle replacement. I do a total ankle with an anterior approach as well. Um, I have done the lateral approach if I have to fuse both the double joints. So if I have to fuse the, uh, the ankle and the subtalar joint, uh, because that offers uh, sort of access to both the joints through the lateral side. There has been some emphasis on the home run screw, like you start from the posterior malleolus. Uh, does it uh, concern for the exam? Do they ask about the home run concept? No, no. I think that's that's too technical. That's too technical. Yeah. Mr. Stewart, to be to be fair, you see, uh, my experience is that your examiner would probably not be a foot and ankle surgeon. Okay. Uh, it'll be a gen general examiner. They might be an upper limb surgeon or a shoulder surgeon. So they. They would want you to stick to basic principles, but they would not quite sort of tease out all these yes. information about a home run screw and everything else. You, you need to know the technique that you can put a screw from the posterior mal into the tailor neck. Uh, that can be done as well. But I don't think they will be asking you those questions. They would ask, I mean, they'd ask you your preference of what you would want to put, what screws, how many screws, would you use plates and everything else. But those nitty gritty, I mean, that is more common if you, in the viva settings, like when you have a basic science viva or something where they will ask you more about um, compression and rigid fixation and techniques of eccentric and lax screw techniques. Okay. Now there's uh, something regarding the ankle replacement that you mentioned, not with respect to the FRC's exam. You typically use a mobile bearing ankle replacement, right? Yes. Okay, so do you have an issue of uh, the poly spin out? Because that is a very common problem. I mean, not very common, a rare but dangerous problem in a total knee. No, I haven't. I mean, you I means you could actually break the poly or wear the poly out, but I have not had the poly subluxing out, and I have not come across any of my other colleagues having a similar problem. I um, mean, there is some. I mean, the star is one of the the most proven ankle joint replacement, which is being done in states and here uh, with a long-term follow-up. And the risk of uh, poly wear is there as with any poly, but not with dislocation. I, I have seen in knees, I know. I know what you're saying because I have seen a few cases where the, uh, the poly has come out. But I, I think in this respect, the the ankle joint is quite well stabilized. So provided you have balanced your joint properly and there is no obvious ligament deficiency or any other injuries, then I don't think that the poly is free flowing. It's not going to butt out. Okay. So is, is that the more, is the STAR the most commonly used process? Is STAR and agility, if, uh, if I remember? No, no, no. The STAR is not the commonly, the commonly used now in UK with, uh, with the recent uh, uh, ankle with the joint registry is uh, the infinity ankle, which is from what we showed, which is the fixed bearing, um, which is being uh, used quite prolifically here. But uh, there has not been long-term follow-up that I think minimum is around three, four years uh, follow-up studies on that. Whereas the star is, although they have changed the jigs, um, and this is a new advanced uh, um, prosthesis we've got, and they've changed the polyliner as well uh, with the backing. So we've still got quite a high um, long-term follow-up rate on that. And uh, there are published data of around 80, 89% success with that, especially from the States. But I mean, as I said, the ankle arthroplasty is evolving. I mean, there's, there's no choice like, um, and obviously the results are not as similar to what you get in hips and knees, uh, arthroplasty. So it's still developing and there's a lot of, uh, and not everybody believes in it. So quite a lot of foot and ankle surgeons actually don't want to take that over or use that in their practice because they don't believe in that there's still the right time to do it. Because as I said, the risks are quite a lot. If, if it fails, then what were you left with that? There are some people who are doing revision surgery using the in-bone, which is a much bigger implant and everything else, but it has got problems of failure. So we have not yet found the right mix. We're still developing answers and new techniques. So still, uh, we are evolving. I wouldn't say that we have 
come or we have uh, ticked the box yet. Okay, that's pretty interesting. Uh, Dr. Anjani, I think there are no more questions. Uh, we have covered almost significantly the entire spectrum of ankle arthritis. And that was very kind of you to come on a Sunday to deliver this lecture. Uh, thank you once again on behalf of all the audience. And uh, we look forward for more from your side. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Yeah. And then the great.